It's showtime. This is a one-man pour, except I've got to manage a camera. So I talked to Dustin about it, and he said, well, why don't you use Kevin? And I remembered that I had met Kevin Steele 30 years before on a concrete pour, and then he was in my shop with Dustin, working on Dustin's smoker, and so he's gonna come out this morning and give me a hand on a little five-yard footing pour that's a little fussy. So we're gonna be dumping concrete right into this little opening right here, and it's gonna cover everything. Now I've already used good old-fashioned Crisco. This is what's left over to, what, to grease the top of the bolts and the inside of the forms and the chamfer strip. And I forgot until right now that I'm also gonna fill the screw heads with Crisco because they're gonna be covered with concrete and a Torx drive bit will not go into a Torx drive screw head that's full of concrete, but it will go right into the Crisco. The water just reduces how much the concrete wants to stick to the forms. It wets the subgrade, which doesn't really matter in a footing, but it just gives me the illusion that I've done every possible thing that I can to ensure success. And that, my friends, is worth a lot at a moment like this. So he's at about a three inch slump. If it's just too tight, we'll loosen it up a little bit. But a low slump is gonna help us here for the first little bit. spinning backwards, rev it up. So the rule of thumb is one gallon of water will increase the slump of one yard of concrete one inch. So I'm guessing he had about two and a half yards left. We want to increase the slump from the three it showed up at to a six or so. So he's putting 10 gallons in there and going to thoroughly mix it up. So you've probably noticed all these long wires sticking out and you've thought, well, that's not very neat. And the reason they're left long is so at a moment like this, 
I can untie it. And I don't have to get out pliers to cut them off. Especially over here. So in general, when you're using tie wire to hold forms in position, leave the tails on it so you can take it apart. Watch your eyes. The edges of that all exposed <clears throat> should strip all right in a week or so when I pull those forms off do the same thing to the other side the Crisco is popular This concrete dropped into this form about three and a half hours ago. And it is hard, I mean it is hard. You know, ordinarily you don't want to strip templates off of anchor bolts because you don't want to disrupt the anchor bolts, but I didn't hurt these a bit. And I'm just trying to get a little nicer finish around the edges that are gonna be exposed. I think I'm worrying about nothing, but it's a nice day and all I've gotta do is clean this up, so. I'm just going to let this dry out a little bit from the surface water I just put on, broom it, and uh, call her a day. Some big posts that are going to hold a gate that's going to go across the driveway. I already knew you were going to build a new gate. You already knew it? Yeah. It's time to pull the forms off these things and see what they look like. The chamfer on the corners, the detail on the formwork, I just hope there's not a bunch of rock pockets. And after three or four days waiting for them to get good and hard, it's time to find out. So this is the first unveiling that I've been nervous about. You remember I had to drill the holes through this little piece of formwork that I got wrong and then try to make sure that we had consolidated enough material down through those inch and a half holes to fill all these corners. Looks like we had success. This is all going to cover up as you will see. But in the meantime, it's time to break out the Burke bar and start busting these things off of here. Well, I didn't have the camera running when I knocked these forms off of here, but I'm pleased. It all looks good. The proportion looks good. The consolidation's good. I can sack and patch this up, and it's going to be perfect, I hope. I've said it before, and you've probably heard me say it. The thing with form work is it needs to have every single nail that you need to hold it together and not one more. Because when you have to tear them apart, it's easy to realize that you got just plain carried away, but it's a lot better to be carried away than to have a blowout.
just right. It's a win. We're going to sack and pat that. We might leave it alone and just get my little diamond wheel on my grinder and just buff off that chamfer and put the plate on there. Now you've probably already noticed, if you do this kind of work, that there is a world of difference between doing this work, this noisy, dirty, heavy, hot, and most of it buried work for yourself and your family in your own front yard compared to doing it for somebody else. Perhaps you're poorly paid. Perhaps you're unappreciated. Perhaps you've been lied to, or perhaps you're working with jerk co-workers in bad weather. Because all of that happens, and all of it happened to me, too. But can you see that these negative and maybe all too prevalent conditions in modern construction are necessary for your development as a skilled construction worker, as a qualified tradesman? What other possible way is there to learn the width and depth of skills and more importantly character that you're going to need to become the man, the employer, the husband, the father that you know you must become before you finish your race? You've got to learn to work at the daily difficulty as if it is in fact the most important education that is possible for you to receive and then figure out how to receive it and then figure out how to implement it. Now in the next video you're going to see me start in on the steel fabrication. I've got to make base plates to accommodate these bolts and these conduits. I've got to save and modify and clean up some old H-beam that I've had laying around for years. I've got to implement a design that I worked on and that frankly I am anxious to see come to life. Thanks for watching Essential Craftsman and keep up the good work.